welcome to episode two of the Mindset Lab, where in today's episode, we learn from Dr. Jennifer Walenga's experience going from an elite athlete to a leadership expert. Dr. Walenga is known as a Canada Sports Hall of Famer for her incredible rowing career, winning gold at really all the highest levels of international competition. She is a professor at Royal Rose University in Victoria, BC. Having taken her learning experience from sport into leadership, Dr. Walenga is active in researching creativity in a high performance mindset, workplace health, and social innovation. <laughs> when saying all this, it kind of sounds like you're some far off icon, but you're with us today on the Mindset Lab. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's, so, it's a pleasure, total pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Of course, if you were with us last week, you would recognize Dr. Jennifer Fraser, who is an award-winning author, educator, and researcher on abuse and its effect on the brain. Jen, thanks for being here again. I'm so delighted to be here. I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Walinga about her work and what it means for athletes, what it means for coaches, and what it means for leaders. Yeah, very well said. Um, I, think, I think as a starting place, having uh, made your way through the ranks of, of rowing in Canada, Dr. Walinga, um, and becoming an elite athlete, what's a, what coaching strategies worked with you and your crew and what ones didn't and, and why? Let's start with the ones that didn't. I think I was really fortunate. I counted up as part of an exercise with my daughter recently, and we both had around 30 coaches in our lifetimes, right? And competing kind of in a similar years, um, span of years. And really I had one where the techniques probably didn't work. You know, they really, um, it wasn't so much that they didn't work for me. Cause again, I was very lucky and I wasn't subjected to his uh, tactics of power over uh, quite abusive, I would say physically, mentally, emotionally, and also uh, a lot of like harassment of, of the athletes around me, not all of them, you know, like they do, they'll target specific athletes. So even as an athlete kind of watching this, observing it, being imposed on others, it didn't work for me at all. It didn't scare me. It just kind of um, made me feel that maybe actually helped me form my, my perspective around what good coaching is. So probably in any, in, in some degrees, it helped me uh, in that way. It didn't inspire me as an athlete. It didn't scare me as an athlete. I simply just went about my business, but what it didn't teach me is how to stand up for others. I think I just kind of kept doing my thing and uh, allowed it to unfold and kind of accepted it. So it didn't work in that way as well. Um, I think it contributed to the, the current sort of state of affairs that we have in sport where there's a lot of people just standing by and allowing it to continue even if they disagree. Those that worked, and I've done quite a bit of reflection on this personally, but also as a researcher to try to tease out what it was that did work. Uh, I would say these concepts or principles were common all the way across the other 29 coaches I was lucky enough to uh, have experienced. And a big thing that came out of this recent case study we did on that 92 group. So we had a, a group of women who were supported by a number of coaches leading up to that, that quad or that Olympic year. But uh, we spent some time really talking to all the participants, whether they were in the crews themselves that competed at the Olympics or part of the wider training group, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, just doing that, but we teased out some core principles, and one of them, the main, the main one, I would say, was it was a non-hierarchical setting. So whether our coach intended it or not, and I've talked to him about this, he said it was kind of accidental. Uh, he created a situation where power was balanced. It didn't start that way. I think he adopted some of the techniques that we all adopt in coaching and teaching and any kind of leadership role of power over others and uh, exerting that kind of dominance and you know taking the lead and at the top of the hierarchy and but gradually he his values took precedent over those kind of tactics and he kind of couldn't help himself but balance the power and so what i mean by that is at the center of our focus both he as a coach and us as athletes were focused on the same thing and it was shared and it was a gold medal standard, we called it, but it, was, it wasn't it was a gold medal. It was a time, a standard of excellence. We were all focused on it and we all increasingly became partners in achieving that goal. That's such a fantastic um, description of how things go wrong in bullying scenarios. And we talk all the time about 
how bullying is ruining sport. Bullying is ruining educational experiences for children. And as you know, it ruins organizations. So as soon as you allow it to flourish and it all hinges on power imbalance. And so in Paul Pelletier's book, he's a lawyer and he works on workplace bullying. Uh, he talks about, um, he would put a label on what you just described as servant leader. And that's your coach. Your coach is serving the team. The team is serving him. It's what, um, Joe Ehrman says the football, he's considered one of the greatest football coaches in America. He says the team's job is to love each other and his job is to love the team. And that's all that matters. And it's this, this idea that you are serving leadership at all times in each of your players, your rugby players or your rowers or, or your organization. And then the flip is, um, Paul Pletchy calls it the command and control model. And the command control model is you're always trying to accrue power to yourself. Ironically, of course, because you actually feel destabilized and insecure. And so what I'm really interested in, and I'm curious, Jen, if you've been working on this or Jameson, if this is something that you've been seeing as a phenomenon in all the work you do with sport, I'm really interested in rehabilitation, like somehow getting in between into a sort of a liminal zone where we don't say to the coach who's caught in this command control model, we say to them, you know what, this is what you're caught in, but there is another way. And we're going to facilitate that for you so that we start looking at contemporary science that says, you know, we can change if we're trapped in control command model, we can become a servant leader and our brain can actually reflect this on the inside as much as our behavior reflects it on the outside. And this is where I think we need to move. So I don't know, Jen, if that's something that you're starting to see with organizations that you work with and motivate and so on to make change. It's such a good point. And I've been wrestling with it for sure. How do we help people see that there's another way? So we've been calling it winning better, um, winning with benefits. Why wouldn't we want to win? So we're not talking about participation ribbons or an either or that you, you either win or you are healthy <laughs> and intact. Um, it's both, it's everything. And why shouldn't we challenge people as coaches and athletes to try to achieve more through sport? So let's win, nothing wrong with trying to win or have your best performance really is what, what, how you wanna frame it. But let's try for excellence, but let's also try for excellence in self-development um, and team development and those kind of qualities as well. So I've, I've experimented with that a bit of kind of throwing down the gloves to coaches like, hey, you know, great, you've, you've had some wins or you've had some successes or some PBs or world records, whatever you, they are, whatever measures of success, but, but have you developed leaders as well? That's the real sign of a truly excellent coach. So posing it as a challenge, I think that can be powerful. But what I think I've encountered is there is a, there is an appeal there is a huge appeal to command and control. There's an appeal to the machismo uh, associated with it. Uh, even my husband and I, and you know, he's a super liberal guy, but you know, we'll be watching, you know, some The Last Kingdom or something, you know, some medieval warring movie or show, and he'd be like, "But what about that?" You know, or my good buddy Nick Clark, he's a, a strength and conditioning practitioner, expert, leader, great, amazing liberal guy, but he'll he'll talk about just wanting to crush someone in rugby. And I think, you know, what is that? And I totally identify with it. I'm like that on the soccer field, basketball floor, totally it comes out. Um, but we're not saying we want to delete that element, whatever that element is. But I think part of our path, Jen and Jameson, is that we have to figure out how to have it all uh, without having these costs you know, the win at all costs, like the costs are what worry us all, right? Uh, the people are limping out of sport, broken emotionally, physically, mentally, um, and that we're fostering coaches that behave terribly as well. So we're, we're enabling that and that's not good for them either. Right? So love this rehabilitation concept. I think maybe it's about showing, I know there are lots of coaches I've talked to who started with a very hammering intense because that's what they learned. And then they gradually learned new ways. Uh, so they rehabilitated because of the people around them and themselves. But I do think there are also those who cannot be rehabilitated and they have been invited in to a, an incredibly autonomous context. And they've been attracted to that autonomous. We've seen it in education. We've seen it in sport. It's appealing. Not Nancy Hogshead Makar talks about um, not every coach is a pedophile, but every pedophile wants to coach. 
we leave the door open way too far for complete autonomy and access to look at Sandusky, right? He had access to so many little boys. Nasser had total access to all of those hundreds of girls. So that's, I think, the issue is how do we close the door to that, make it very unappealing to those kind of um, mindsets and, and make it very clear to everybody else that there are supports in place, there are policies and governance in place that are going to bring out the best in you as a coach to achieve high performance and healthy, mentally, emotionally, physically healthy individuals who also go out into the world and lead in a positive way and, and contribute to society, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't want to lose the importance of what you're saying in, in terms of just like how how some of the institutions that are evolve, like revolving around sport kind of focus on or they lose sight of the humanity of individuals and young people in particular. As a young athlete, I noticed um, myself, at least I, I idolize players who are tough and who are big and and like and play play strong. Right. And this idea of toughness. And I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how much society kind of idolizes people who endure abuse. I'm curious where you draw the line between an athlete who is, who is tough or an athlete who is, who is maybe numb to what's happening around them. Beautifully articulated. I think that is the issue, right? That we haven't defined what we really mean by uh, toughness. We throw resiliency around a lot too, but my experience, the deeper I weighed in and Jen's been in this world for way longer than I have, um, so I'd love to hear your perspective on this, but the deeper I weigh, wade into this world, the more I see the numb, uh, congratulated, celebrated. Uh, there's a there's this subtle dismissiveness of those who speak out against abuse uh, as being a bit crazy or weak. Uh, so it just adds to the discourse around mental weakness if you can't handle a bit of tough talk, you know, and it, it's and then you find yourself defending and it's just so unproductive. Um, what I talk about are wounds. So, and I've got lots of friends in working at railroads, lots of friends in the military. So they will correct me when we use, we misuse militaristic coaching or the mil militaristic word to, to describe abuse like it's combat training. They correct me because they say we've moved away from that. Like, yeah, there's this kind of desensitization training uh, to face war, terror, torture, you know, to, to survive, right? And that's your numbing, that's desensitization. But they actually know that they have to heal people after that kind of experience as well. So it's not like it's a positive thing and we're somehow strengthening people. We know we are wounding, scarring, destroying people by putting them through this, but we also want them to survive these really tough situations, which no one should have to face. And so when I think of the body, when there are wounds and scars, not agile, not flexible, not a performance kind of uh, scenario at all, right? For, for someone that's been injured over and over and over again, they're weaker. So that helps, I think, sport, sport people understand the difference between that kind of numbness and destruction and kind of endurance of and coping through these kind of terrible situations compared to a strengthening, which is, you know, proper development, uh, in the weight room, developing proper technique before you start to build mass and all these kind of concepts that we all get in sport. That's what we're talking about. The person who's developed their strength truly and well uh, and health in a healthy way, they're going to be much more tough uh, in a performance setting. And they'll be able to endure the lactic acid. They'll be able to endure the hits. They'll be able to endure, uh, you know, whatever they're, any kind of contact they're facing in their sport, right? because they're equipped to, not because they're all gnarled and wounded. Yeah, it's my big um, goal is exactly what you said about the body. I want people to understand that that is what the neuroscientists have learned about the brain. So, you know, we talk about athletes for life, but even though we might even make their bodies stronger, we are allowing them to get concussed, for example. And then we allow them to suffer unbelievable PTSD through all forms of abuse that gets normalized in our culture, as, as you pointed out. And um, what people don't know, and not even experts, like mental health experts don't know this. Teachers aren't taught this. Professors aren't taught this. Um, coaches aren't taught this. They actually can see now on brain scans, it's visible, 
scarring on the brain. They call it neurological scars. They see the withering of myelination. They see um, parts of the brain shrinking and shriveling like the hippocampus. So, I mean, this information is available. It's been around for about 20 years. I see it as critically as important as what we learned from x-rays that smoking causes cancer. But it's amazingly difficult to get people to um, make the mental shift. And this is where the rehab part comes in again for me. I'm like, we have to start with knowledge of what's happening to our young people's brains. Adolescent brains are the most vulnerable. That's when the intensive training happens. And, you know, you were lucky by, obviously you had a lot of mental resilience going in, but, and you weren't targeted, but someone who's targeted and they don't have that necessarily, maybe it's not, they don't have family. They don't have a financial opportunities. They haven't had past coaches that have strengthened them. So they're susceptible. Well, those are the people that really worry me. And I just, I want to get that information into the hands of the leaders. You guys need to know, we're talking brain damage. We're not just talking the gnarled body. It's, if we could look into the brains, like what we discovered with concussed brains, it's pretty terrifying. And our kids don't know, we don't know, and nobody governmentally is making this shift. So, I mean, if this podcast can do anything, it's so much my passion it's jameson's passion and the whole team at ryerson we want to get the information talked about and out there it's like let's talk brain images when people are being emotionally physically and sexually abused it's frightening i, I think about where where that's showing up for at least in athletes and 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 kind of sport administrators alike i think of role models as, as i mentioned before but until athletes are coming, or I guess it's kind of more of a focus now that athletes are coming out talking about their experiences with this, like in the NHL, for example, more athletes that have realized as having a role of the hitman or the, the tough guy in, in hockey comes back to haunt you a lot earlier than you would expect. And and to have brain scans that sh literally show that I think is, is very important. You mentioned Jen about like kind of the younger generation. And, and it's reminding me about what we talked about with Russ Smith last episode about um, his approach with kids about making kids kind of uh, the happiest and what leaves them feeling the most accomplished at the end of their kind of uh, sport like experience. And um, it kind of reminds me a little bit about Dr. Willinga, what uh, you said in an interview with the Times Colonist, and that was about um, youth sports and rampant abuse that that kind of comes from coaches, comes from sometimes parents and uh, and even other players at, at the youth level. Your your point in the interview was kind of talking about how much abuse affects an athlete's confidence and and sense of self specifically among adolescents. Are you able to speak about that a little bit? Yeah, and and I think uh, this is where empowering the athletes is crucial too. So I, I mean, Jen's a teacher, we're teachers, right? So we go to education right away. And I, I really think that is the, the key piece. So in um, equipping kids with the ability to recognize when they're being maltreated, is really important, um, but also in encouraging them or equipping them with the pathways to get help. And I think we need to be pretty creative there because sometimes, yeah, it's not your parent and definitely it's not always the higher up, the next step in the coaching path, because, you know, if it's an athletic director or something, they may have the same interests as the coach they're protecting and, and that can be uh, problematic, but they're often sent, you know, they're sent to the coach that's abusing them or they're sent, da da da. Um, equipping them with the, the knowledge, but also the tools and the pathways and the support systems. It's tough though, because um, I also think that it's not, it's not cool. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but it's like, we don't want to open up the door to those kinds of supports and resources, it seems to me. Um, we hide them. So the knowledge is there. Um, the resources are there. Safe sport is strong in Canada. We have good systems, good processes, good resources, but the NSOs kind of hide them. I think they're afraid that if they open the door to, there'll be a floodgate of complaints. And there will be, frankly, there will be, because we need to clean things up. Um, so there's that, but I think also, um, Increasingly, kids are going, screw it, we, we don't want to do sport. They're seeing 
there's so many factors here. I didn't even know where to start. You know, I think they're seeing the abuse, they're seeing the intensity and the intensity is actually hyping up because of our model in uh, funding in Canada that, that only supports and values metals. So we're getting completely misconstrued in, in that framework too. Um, and we're just seeing kids kind of go, it's not fun anymore, or I, I, I'm not going to thrive in this situation and they're turning away, but, or we're losing them because they have been abused and they're broken, but then they don't have sport. Like they turn away from sport, which is the thing we know, which can really build their confidence, right? When it's facilitated well. So it's just such a conundrum. And uh, I think always education is a way to start and I think equipping, empowering people with the understanding and the knowledge coaches, athletes, parents, everybody, we have to come at it from all directions. But the big thing for me, I keep coming back to is this cool factor. I think that's something that we have to understand better and, um, and address. So the smoking analogy is a good one because we know, we know, we know, we know so much about the damage it's doing secondhand smoke, lungs, brain, everything. Uh, and But it was so cool. You look so cool when you're smoking, right? And I think sports the same. It's so cool to smash someone. It's so cool to be really tough and get up, even though you're injured and keep playing. Oh, my God. Look at what we did when Carla Strug, do you remember the little, I think her name is Carla Strug, Strug, the little gymnast from the um, United States, 96 Olympics. She's the kid who jumped, did a, did a vault on a broken foot. She had a broken foot and she completed the vault. She knew it was broken. They knew it was broken. Her terrible coach knew it was broken. And all the whole world celebrated afterward when she helped them win the gold medal as he's carrying her out with her completely smashed ankle now, right? And I think I was there. I think I celebrated. I kind of went, wow, that's amazing. Didn't really think it through, right? So normalized. So that's the thing I think we got to really try to figure out is how do we make it uncool to you know, be Uhtred, son of Uhtred, be so tough that we're willing to walk around with a missing limb or whatever and keep going. Like, how do we, how do we battle that cultural strangeness? So, Jen, if you don't mind, just, yeah. one thing I'm noticing around my generation is how it's, it's almost, it's cool to do that, but it's also not necessarily super cool to talk about the opposite side of things, which is what we're doing right now. And I'm, like, like, I don't know what exactly what it is. And I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to have like a, a support system around me throughout sport where I can talk about it with my friends if there's something that comes up and it still can, even if it doesn't feel cool in the moment, it's at least talked about enough where I can normalize it for myself so that even if everything around me isn't as focused on like, am I really okay? Or, or is, am I really like enjoying this, this scenario? I still have a support system to go back to and not everyone has that. And it's not necessarily cool to have that either. It's like always this constant pushing through and Jen, a lot of your research is kind of focused on that. And I, I realized I kind of interrupted you there, but are you able to speak to that a little bit, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fraser? Oh, yeah. No, no, you didn't interrupt me at all. I think we both just want to jump in and respond to Dr. Walinga because she's saying it's very interesting, important things. Um, so just my two pronged response to that is, first of all, I agree 100 percent that the key is education. And I just want to float this idea with the two of you, because one of the things that I've been struggling with is, you know, I talk to people about this all the time, and I feel the same way you do, uh, Dr. Wulinga. I feel so um, overwhelmed. It's like, where do we begin and why can't we exit this? Why are we so trapped in this model when this model's out of date? You've been, you've called it antediluvian or dinosaurial. I can't remember what term you, I laughed out loud when I, I think you said knuckle dragging. I remember laughing out loud. I was just like, yeah. This is caveman. Can we not in the 21st century do something a little bit different with the knowledge we now have? Like, and why are we so stuck? And it's a question I ask myself a lot. And a number of things that you said in this um, really strike a chord with me because one of the things I think we need to do is take the onus off the coach. So we educate, oh, the coach has got to do a workshop. Oh, the coach has got to learn this. Coach needs this. No, we need to educate the children starting from a very early age just like even though we were panicked about it and we thought that if we taught them about sex education, they'd all run out and have sex with each other. And if they didn't know, then we would keep them safe and then they could get married and have sex. You know, we believe that for a long time and we still, there's still people that have anxiety around it, but can't we do the same thing with abuse? If a child knew what a pedophile was, what luring was, what grooming was, what a Jekyll and Hyde was, what all of these different things are, what emotional abuse looks like, sounds like, 
our kids would be empowered to protect themselves. Just like we tell them they have to wear shin pads, they need to wear a helmet, um, they've got to put in a mouth guard. They also need to know all the equipment required to stop abuse in its tracks. And if we had all the kids educated, and this is where I think the education piece needs to go. And we've talked about, we should really, you know, get some of this course material together. It's the same group that needs the education, not the coaches, the parents and the caretakers. They need to know all the red flags of pedophilia. They need to know the red flags of emotional abuse. They need to know that when the athlete comes home, closes their door and cries, there's something wrong. And they need to help them have a vocabulary. Like Jameson, you're lucky you can talk to your friends and you've always had that vocabulary and maybe the emotional knowledge or social emotional narrative to be able to articulate what's going on. But I'm an abuse victim. And when I was in high school in the 1980s, I couldn't have strung a sentence together about what was happening to us. Um, I really had no idea. And it took me until I was a middle-aged adult actually doing the research that I started to get the flashbacks and go, I mean, there was the court case and the whole thing. I just never dealt with it. It just, it was like it happened to another person. Talk about numbing. It was in a very tidily constructed box and I just was not going to deal with it. And the thing is too, what really worries me is we talk in sport all the time about how, you know, the second you talk to gymnasts or Olympians, um, they will say it happens in sport because sport is competitive. And so we allow abuse to happen because the person gets medals and then everyone looks the other way. So we could say, we could talk about this with the Whitecaps or Alpine Canada or Rowing Canada even. But the bottom line is, I was abused in a public high school in Vancouver in an outdoor education program called Quest. There were no medals. There's no medals being won in the Catholic Church. There's no medals being won in Boy Scouts. Yeah, they get the sash, but it's not quite the same thing. So why are abuses so rampant and so normalized in our society that we, we hit this wall where we say, we don't even know how to begin to dismantle it. And so I agree, I think it's education we make it very uncool and we empower youth, you know, to have a vocabulary to talk about it and to resist and to know, and to know how to, how to stop it. Like, yeah. goes back yeah. to your point about power and balance, Jen. Yeah. Empower them and, and correct pathways for support because uh, I've had, you know, I've heard a friend say, well, they, they just need to speak up. Well, okay. They often do, actually. Some of these kids that are so empowered, they do. It doesn't work. And actually, then they're, you know, it just almost enhances the, the abuse and bullying. So where do they actually go? And it's not clear to a lot of kids. And it isn't clear to a lot of anybody, I think. I find I have a lot of, I have like this conduit for, I'm trying to kind of count it up, about 40 or 50 people have come through me. And I've been trying to figure out why to get to support, you know, and I'll send them to third party, to the equity office, wherever, whatever context they happen to be in uh, for governance support or whatever it is. But why do they come to me first? Well, they know me. Uh, they know I know a bit about this. Uh, they trust me. I'm, I'm not threatening them in any way. I don't hold power over them or anything. Um, but so there's something missing there. You know, they, everybody needs a gen, a gen. A Jameson in their life that they can go to first and then they need to all be equipped so I love that piece about the caregivers and parents too um, and the, just the whole world we all need to know how to help kids out of these terrible situations but you raise a really important point Ken, uh, Jen is what are we protecting because yeah people go well they get results so we want to protect them because they win a lot of like Dave Scott Thomas right won a lot of champs so we're protecting them I don't know about that because like you I've seen a lot of bullies be protected and they have no results to speak up necessarily. So there's something else there. What do you think it is? I actually have a theory on this. So I'm very glad you asked me. My theory is after studying this and studying this, and I actually have a research question for you too, because I know you study this kind of stuff, but what I've, this is my, this is my idea. So let me run it past you too. I think what happens is an, an athletic director or a head of a school or a head of a, a church, let's say, they hear an abuse report and they think to themselves, I mean, they can't handle it. They, they can't, their, their brain can't process that a person that they know, that they trust, that they personally know, that they've seen do wonderful things could possibly 
behind closed doors also be someone who's highly abusive. So Jerry Sandusky is a classic example of this. He is Harvey Weinstein, the man of the hour, loving. Oh, I run a charity. I get all these awards. I'm, I run, you know, I care about whatever it is, you know, Harvey Weinstein it was, I walk a national women's parade day. I'm making a documentary about women. I believe that women have rights and it's all covered. It's this elaborate sort of pantomime of care in order to cover up what he is suffering and acting out and destroying people behind closed doors. So I think what happens is the athletic director or the head of school, whatever, the priest, they get the report and they give the person the benefit of the doubt. They say, you know what? You can't possibly be doing this. So it must be an exaggeration. Like what you were saying, when people report, she's crazy, she's exaggerating, she misinterpreted your, they don't, women don't get flirtation anymore. You know, whatever it is, they, they come up, kids, you know, kids' imaginations. So they make these stories up and it, they do it out of goodness. I mean, you study leaders. So we see lots of good leaders make a lot of mistakes when it comes to abuse reports. So then what happens is they get the second report makes them really uncomfortable because it's like, whoa, a second report? How's that possible? I've been convinced that, okay, well, I'm going to also benefit of the doubt. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to send them to a course on boundaries. This is going to get fixed. Like, no, this is unacceptable. And I've got the second report. By the time the third report comes in, they're, they're complicit. And then they start to get scared about themselves. They're like, if there is another word breathed about this, I'm negligent and I'm doomed. So I'm going to actively cover up the abuse because I'm an accomplice to it. I think that's what happens because it doesn't make sense to me how many good leaders, people who reach significant leadership positions get caught in this abuse cycle. So again, that's a place where in the work that I do, I try and teach um, leaders or I've developed course material to say to them, you have to watch out for what your brain will do. Your brain is going to produce counterfacts. Counterfacts are the stories that you tell when you can't handle a situation and you are panicking. So you make up all these different stories about the victim. It becomes victim blaming. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's because you don't know any better and you haven't been trained to actually respond properly to abuse reports. So that's my theory. I'd love to hear some feedback. I, I notice I'm almost, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Willinga, I'm, I'm, I notice I'm almost like kind of like shut myself off to, off to certain stories because it feels almost like there's so many coming out and there's so many, there's so much bad news that's happening that I'm just kind of like almost disassociated while trying to, and there's no way that I can show my support, it feels like sometimes. And I, and I think about the concept that you mentioned about like responsibility and and kind of taking ownership of, of learning at a, at a certain age. And I mean, I'm, I'm on this podcast to learn as well. And, I'm, and, I, and that's what I'm kind of, trying to to understand more because the more I understand what listening to actual um, other people's stories are and other people's experiences the more I can also understand what's happening in my head and what's happening when I'm out on the field playing cricket or, or on the court playing basketball like the the feeling of, of like flow state and actual competition and and like this toughness is so far off from a conversation of like understanding yourself and your and your coach understanding yourself or the friends my friends around me understanding themselves and I, I think about education as a, as a starting place, as you all mentioned. But um, that's kind of where my go, my head goes through right away is how disconnected actual listening, how how disconnected I am from actual listening to other people's experiences and and listening to the education of like there is going to be these counter counter arguments that my brain makes. Yeah, that's that's my thoughts. Yeah, I love the theory, and I think it is uh, that's it. It's a boiled frog, right? They gradually get sucked into this state of complicitness. And we also behave as we want to just shut it off. It gets overwhelming and we want to just can't deal with it. Um, the, the whole U.S. election thing is bringing to service for me. And I'm seeing it on a very small scale in a local club I participate in where the missing piece is the responsibility. You sort of go to sleep like the Dems did in 2016 and didn't vote. And then in, in comes Trump <laughs> and now he's in and the tentacles are in there. And even though he's lost the, Republicans are in, in so many different ways, right? So I think, yes, now we've shown up, people have shown up and taken responsibility and we're starting to do that more and more, but it's relentless. We can never stop being responsible. And it actually reminds me a lot of sport where I have this favorite example of the Canadian women's soccer team playing the American women in, it would have been the 2012 Olympics. 
So they're playing in the semi. You guys might remember this game. And Christine Sinclair scores one nothing. Then it's one one. Then it's two one. Then it's two two. Then it's three two. And we're running out of time. And Canada is probably going to win this semi. And it's so exciting. And Abby Wambach starts talking to the ref, right, about how uh, our goalie is holding the ball too long. And then she gets herself a little penalty called. And instead of kicking the ball, trying to score with it, Rapineau kicks it right at Tancredi's face, right, and puts her hand up, handball. They get a now they get a full on net. Penalty shot, they tie the game. We have probably, I don't know, five minutes left or something. They score again because the momentum has shifted probably. And and Canada's caught on their heels with indignation, right? And to me, that illustrates they were asleep. You got to be ready for that stuff. You got to be, we got to be ready for the fact the reality of our society is that there are some psychopaths out there <laughs> and they are looking for opportunities to hurt people. So we do, we just need to have our spidey senses up all the time and be responsible sport participants, coaches, teachers, parents, athletes, and be aware of this weird dynamic of power imbalance. We need to understand your theory of how we become increasingly complicit. I'm there. I've written letters of support, you know, for these kind of people. And now as I, you know, 15 years have gone by and I realized, oh God, that was, that was me doing the little flip, right? And, uh, or trying to turn it off or make it go away or, but complicit. And then you feel embarrassed and it's hard for people to be authentic and admit that they've made a mistake or misread a situation. And we got to listen to our kids, man, because I went, I just went through it a few years ago where, you know, kids telling me from all over and I kept kind of trying to rationalize it, explain it away. You know, it can't be, it can't be. It took months. I thank God, thank God they're relentless, you know, and that they are equipped to really keep speaking up and fighting for their sense of self. So I also felt good, you know, that we had raised these kids in our community to be, to be that strong, but, but, you know, it's, it's a lose, lose, lose situation because those kids, yeah, they're fighting and they're strong, but they're, they've lost their sport. They've lost years of time. They've lost wonderful experiences. It's just tragedy all around. Don't want to end on that negative note. <laughs> I think, no, I think, I think what's, um, what's really interesting is what you just described. And I think it's happened to me and I mean, both of us have done a deep dive into a lot of research on these sorts of issues. You know, what makes the great leader? What makes the great athlete? What makes great coaching? How, how do you infuse creativity? Like Jameson, you talked about flow state. You know, where do we get to that mindful place where the goal isn't that you're, you know, demeaning or hurting or, or um, manipulating others. You're actually just in this beautiful thing together that you talked about at the very beginning, um, Jan, as, as an elite athlete, it was this incredible experience of partnership with other people to achieve excellence. Like in an organization, in a sport, in, in anything, that's an amazing feeling that just builds people up and it builds community as we learned in talking with Russ Smith um, in the last podcast. So I think the key word is, and it's happened to me in the research too, where I've looked at some of my behaviors or ways I've tried to address this or my own parenting. And I've thought to myself, ah, oh, I could be better. I could do better. And a really important thing that's come up in this is, and I think, um, Jen, you've really tried to be clear on, on it, and you just referenced it again. 29 people are human beings with growth mindset that want to be better. They're coaches who want to, to question their own methods that they were trained by. They want to be the best for their athletes. They're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to stumble. They're going to hurt somebody and then have to apologize. That's all growth mindset. That's where rehabilitation happens. But there's the one person, one out of 30 is a sociopath. And if we don't learn about that, and if we don't equip children and people in power and caretakers and parents to really recognize the signs of the fixed mindset, the person that can't be helped, that can't be um, changed, and that believes, you know, you look at a Trump, that person has an entrenched mindset. That person believes always that they're a victim. They don't see the hurt they do. They just can't see it. And that's a dangerous person. And we have to learn to be as worried about that person as we are about fire. So you look at all of the education and the practice and the, um, the experts that are brought in and the buildings that have to be up to code with a fire in a school. Why do we not do that same type of training and 
urgency around very dangerous sociopathic abusive people because we don't but our kids don't get burned in school they don't they we we practice the experts come in they assess the situation what we do have is many children in all kinds of situations whether it's religion education sport arts they are being harmed in serious ways suicide is the second leading cause of death in our youth populations not fire so we need to really change gears as a culture and address some of these difficult topics and have these fierce conversations because that's the only way we're going to make change and it's this stepping away from responsibility is fatal it's fatal on a personal level and on an organizational level we have to start holding people accountable and responsible for how they conduct themselves and that's how we could do a lot of healing and rehab with the 29 and we encourage the one to go and work with computers or something and not children yeah, I, it seems almost like this is in your wheelhouse, uh, Dr. Willinga. I, I was reading up about your your integrated focus, uh, like eight step model, and and it kind of seems like that out of the box thinking is kind of very in line with stepping out of what what Russ and what uh, Dr. Fraser mentioned was kind of the bullying abuse paradigm, and and kind of stepping out of it altogether and like a restructuring. Um, as far as that eight step model goes, like that that integrated focus model, it kind of like the way you put it was kind of a creative approach to problem solving and, and at an organizational level as well. And that kind of seems like a possible solution. Um, can you speak to that? You bet. And I'm happy to say that I work with a group of sports scientists and they really embrace this little model, which was cool to see because it doesn't always, I get a lot of kind of blinking in organizations when I try to share how it works. And all it is, is an integration, accepting the fact that you have one out of 30 that's going to be sociopathic, accepting the fact, the barrier, the challenge that is our our minds and how we flip and how we want to avoid or how we go into denial accepting that and working that into our problem frame so integrating it into this the the problem we're trying to solve unlocks insight better insight so we typically just kind of battle the fact that you know there's abuse in the system and we hammer away and get a headache because we're banging our head against the same old wall instead of going yes this is part of our scenario and we must uh, build up powerful young people who can lead in society and contribute in a positive way, given that there is this element of Trumpism in our society as well. And that demands more creativity. But if you don't bring the two things together, you're not going to spark the creative solutions. Um, that also leads me to be thinking and, and leaning back on what I learned through sport, which was that the strongest muscle is your ability to focus. So if I could be completely focused, I'm in flow. I'm totally going to access the integration of uh, in the synergies within my body that allow me to go beyond myself, right? And you have those amazing peak performances. But to be able to totally focus, we need to be able to relax. <laughs> and if you can't relax and trust what you're in, which is what our coach gave us, right? So structured that we were able to focus 100% on performance. We didn't have to worry about all these other details. We certainly didn't have to worry about whether we were gonna be in the boat or not, because we were driving that train. We knew exactly how to get into the boat and we were in charge of that. Um, and it was very clear and very explicit. It sounds boring, but I think governance is so crucial. If you don't have a really clear structure, uh, set of policies, procedures, pathways, supports, resources in place, it's pretty tough to just relax and focus, trusting, you know, that things are going to work out okay for you. And it's, I mean, frankly, I, I wasn't a great volleyball player, but I do love watching volleyball and I love volleyball most for its protocol. And it's increasingly adding protocol, right? Uh, a coach cannot complain about a ref call. A kid cannot complain about a ref's call. I love that. I'm so sick of the, uh, you know, or the diving or the, the reaction to a simple protocol that it actually enables us all to perform really well. So I've kind of taken that and transferred that into an organizational setting, sport organizations. The more governance and policy we have in place that's, uh, that's designed with those values in mind, uh, that's the other problem is so many things are designed with um, toughness, smashing, winning medals in mind. And, and that's another big hill for us to climb here, I think, is how do we make sure that what's driving our sports system is, is 
performance and health together, right? It can't just be one at the cost of the other. Uh, that's going to take some work <laughs> and lots of leadership. Well, this is a question I wanted to ask you, actually. This leads into it really well, because I cannot find anywhere in the research, I can't find peer-reviewed, replicated research that shows that bullying and abusing athletes gets results or in the workplace. There is nothing that shows a managerial style that is bullying. So very unfair, very targeting, very propping certain people up and to crush others and all this business. I, there is no research that shows it's successful, whereas there's a massive stack of research that shows that it, it actually hurts the bottom line. It doesn't lead to, to repeat medals. It might in a fluky way because the athletes, despite the abuse, are such superstars, they, they rise above it. But so you, you look like you're agreeing. You have not seen in all the research that you've done in the book you've written and all this business, the courses you design, you don't see it, right? Me neither. That's why I find it, I call it a myth. It's this outdated way of thinking. Amazingly difficult to, to get people to change their minds though. It's like, it's like, you know, any of these things that we believe in, but people still truly believe that talent is a result of abuse. They, they don't want to say it out loud because it's inappropriate to say, but it shows up all the time. I, I found it really fascinating with the movie Whiplash, which is about a highly abusive music teacher. He's using exactly the same techniques you'd see in sport. So very homophobic. He uses anti-Semitism. It's all about weakness. It's like um, you're mediocre. I can teach you through my abuse to attain greatness. So you'll see music professors at Juilliard literally write in and say, you know, this is unacceptable. This would never happen at Juilliard. You'd lose your job in a flash. Cut to one second later, this same music professor will say, but you know what? When that kid was playing the drums at the end, when he was doing that jazz solo, it brought a tear to my eye. And I said to myself, you know what? This is what the teacher was trying to show him. He was trying to show him how to be a leader. And I think that's really what the truth of the movie is. I'm like, how did that happen to you? How did you, how did you recognize abuse on the one hand and then convince yourself somehow that it was a necessary evil for the, for the person who's performing well? But that is what happens. And again, it's just trying to show these mechanisms to people to kind of shine a spotlight on the myth. It's not true. Why do you believe it so deeply? Why do 70 million people vote for Trump, right? Why do so many people hire known abusers. I mean, we've seen it so many times in sport across Canada, even uh, as these cases are being highlighted and exposed. And I just, I kind of have this weird <laughs> fixation where I'll follow, you know, the story and the, the media is complicit too, where um, the guy gets, you know, called out and then you just watch them travel across the sport landscape and land another job in Arizona or something, you know, it just happens all the time. And, and the stories are harder to find. The ones where they're called out for uh, the abuse and the emotional, physical, any kind of abuse, it, it becomes harder to find. So we want it for some reason. For me, it just comes back to the, it's cool somehow. And I love the word myth. I, I don't know. I, I do think we just have to keep trying to dig in and replace it. I, in leadership, you started with this, Jen, where you talked about security and stability and we crave that and we we uh, mistakenly create hierarchy to give us that sense of stability and there's this one supreme being that's going to have all the answers right sets everybody up for failure but but it it does fulfill that need for stability and strength and i think we do the same thing with the kind of psychopathic coach so how do we replace that with something that is even more integral and, and stabilizing? And that's where I moved to that more circular, non-hierarchical, how do you have something that's so strong at the center that's driving everything and that we can all serve? You know, we all are serving this one thing. Uh, we're going together. It's hard. It's hard, man, because I've, you know, I've been in chats with people in higher posi high positions in, the, in uh, sport leadership in Canada and they want to change. They want to kind of stuck. They're trapped, just like you described the athletic director. You know, it strikes me as a deep psychological issue, and it goes back to something that you talked about at the very beginning, Jen, when you talked 
about obedience. I, I just obeyed. I just, I didn't speak up. I didn't do anything because I was taught basically like you don't speak up to power, right? You don't talk up to the hierarchy. Who are you? You're just an athlete. It's not your position to tell the coach how to behave and what to do. It's being hammered into us as kids. We have to respect adults, especially those in educational positions. They'll tell us what our value is, right? They'll tell us if we're smart as a student, if we have good character, same thing with an athlete. Are you a talented athlete? Do you have good character? It's up to these powerful, powerful adults in our world. And so what happens is the child learns to enter the cage of learned helplessness. And the more times you get hurt in the cage of learned helplessness, as shown by research, you don't exit. When the door is opened up and you're free to go, you're done. And the word you've used, Jen, a number of times is broken. And this is really what we have to stop happening. And you're seeing it on the leadership level. They're trapped in the cage of learned helplessness. They don't know how to get out. And I mean, although it's difficult, I truly do believe that is the that is the place where change will happen, like using your integrated model to spark creativity and ignite people to think differently. That's, it's possible. We've seen it through history. We can change. We are done with this paradigm. The bullying abuse paradigm is so destructive and there's so much that's better on the other side. If we could just get out that door. I think of listeners and right now my, my, I'm thinking about who's listening to this podcast and, and if, what kind of changes that, that an athlete, whether they're have, having had an, a career in sport already or just beginning their career in sport. And I'm curious if as a kind of a closing note, if either of you two or both of you two want to speak to that individual who has either had a career in a career in sport or wants to have a career in sport or even, whether it be smaller or big, w- what are some solutions that you would suggest or just some kind of changes in thinking that you could suggest for them? I wanted to highlight, you know, it's things like this that you're doing, that you're facilitating that are going to help. You're spreading the word, you're linking people together, you're making connections, you're helping people, we're challenging people to think a little differently. I think when you get into sport, the key for me is to get good at asking questions because you won't get disinvited when you ask questions. (laughs) So coming in, you know, with your opinions, people are going to... Uh, push back. But if you're asking questions, um, like, so what's at the center for us and on this team? What's most important for us at this team, in this organization, in this group? What are we, why are we doing it again? The why question, I think it's just really easy and really powerful. And it forces people to revisit uh, what we're about. Why sport? I ask that all the time. Why sport again? Oh, yes, for human and social development. It's pretty clear. And as soon as you ask the question, people are answering it. Right? So it's this tricky way. Uh, Edgar Schein talks about um, process consultation and how as soon as you ask a question, you're, you're enacting change, right? So, so powerful. And um, to ask themselves that too, right? Yeah, I think that's all the only advice I have. <laughs> that, that's a perfect, it's the perfect way of um, making practical what you said about power imbalance. Because when you ask a question, you ask participation. You, you're you coming from a place of empathy. You want to know what the other person feels and thinks, what their intentions are. And the second you do that, you become in dialogue. You are not talking down. You're not having power over. You're inviting human connection and social development and health and wellness. So I think, I think if we just end on this beautiful concept Jen has shared with us, it just ask questions and don't believe that you know all the answers, even that's going to start to create social organizational change. Can you, you just try around with me all the time, Jen, because you say it so much more eloquently. Hardly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jameson. Great work. I love it. I, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you joining us on, on the episode for today. Um, in the, in the, in the coming week, we're going to be joined by uh, Jennifer Say, who's the producer of Athlete A, and we'll be sure to be uh, learning a lot more from her. So thank you for joining us on today's episode.
And I just want to give a big shout out to the Ryerson team behind the scenes that do so much amazing work. They're such talented students in Ryerson's very prestigious sport media program. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be having this opportunity. So thanks to them. And yeah, we, um, we've decided to make this podcast only for people who are named Jennifer. So Jennifer <laughs> Malinga, Jennifer Fraser, now we have Jennifer Say. Yeah, you're lucky you're on, Jason. Your, your time might be a little, a little short, but... Yes, thank you again, Dr. Melinda. You are just uh, such an inspiration. So lovely to have you.